Can you hear me well? Okay, sounds good. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, we just had a very small production incident, but I mean, that's nothing new in, in my line of work. Um, I will tell you a little bit of a story about how we use GitOps in Nordea and how we caused a teeny tiny production incident um, early this year, but how also using GitOps we actually managed to get out of it. Um, but moving into the Aarhus, um, yesterday and this morning, I was already reminded that it's that time of the year is when, uh, yeah, every, sorry, every story basically has a prologue. So is that our time of the year? Christmas is coming, and Christmas means delicious food and scrumptious cookies. And um, if you ever watch any cooking show, you will learn that cooks, they basically say that when you are cooking, you're cooking by the taste. That's why you also see all those famous chefs, they say that let's just add a tiny spoon of olive oil and they just go crazy on a pan. And you never understand how come that is a tablespoon of olive oil. But when they do baking, they actually add like very pressure, precise measurements of everything that they put. So the baking is about following directions. The cooking is following your taste, right? Um, and I didn't really believe it, but I have a friend who actually used to work in one of the famous restaurants in, in um, Copenhagen. And uh, once we had this Saturday football morning sort of friend kind of thing, and he brought us a big box of those macrons. I don't know if you know them. It's like very delicious, chocolatey sort of cookies. Excellent ones. And we're sort of like, hey, man, I mean, we know that you bake and you cook and all of that. But I mean, that's a little bit over the top. I mean, you must have spent a lot of time to do those. So, so, so what's up? And he said that that is actually a spoiled batch from the restaurant. It was like, oh, spoiled batch. And, you know, all of us basically just diving in them. It was like, you know, jogging it down. And it's like, what do you mean spoiled batch? We added 5% more cocoa, so it has to be rejected. I was like, okay, that's maybe a little bit strange. But I mean, that's, that's how it is with a, with a great restaurant. So, so it is true that when you're baking, you're following instructions. And for me, this actually relates quite uh, with Kubernetes itself. You have, uh, in Kubernetes, you follow instructions, you have your recipes, your workload YAML file definitions in your cookbook, which is your version control, your Git. And then you have the chef, Kubernetes itself, that basically ingests these, these um, recipes, these directions, and transforms them into workloads, into the pods, containers, and you make your deployments. And you're very happy about it, right? And so um, that's a very neat thing. And Kubernetes does that as no other cook can, is that the main feature of the Kubernetes is actually this nice thing about reconciliation loop. So it's a basically a continuous process that goes and checks what is my design state, what is my actual state on the platform. If they don't match, you basically just do that. And that's a very nice loop sort of that you have an API server and etcd and sort of some controller manager ends up in a container. And if something changes, it basically goes and reconciles and all of that. And then this is automatically the platform side. And of course, it comes you developers, by the way, developers. Okay, operations. Good, sort of 50-50. Everyone else? Okay, <laughs> nice. So we do something on the, on the left side. We actually need to create instructions, right? So what we, what we actually do is that you have a user and you have your Git repository where you shove all of it. And I mean, it would be super nice if there existed something that reconciles all your changes, and then you don't have, to, don't have to worry about it, right? And there were these smart people at Weebworks that actually developed the concept of GitOps. And that is having a small agent, something that is doing one thing and one thing quite well, between your Git repository, where you're shoving all your YAML definitions of what you try to have deployed on the platform, and basically sending it over onto the Kubernetes platform. And that way, the concept of the GitOps, and it's a little bit on the left, is basically extending that reconciliation loop. So it's basically two aspect, aspects to the GitOps, having it as a continuous loop of basically checking what is desired and what is being applied, but also extend it to a version control to the Git repository so you, you have that chain fully connected. And then all of you, would, you don't have to do anything. Everything taken care of you, well, care, care, taken care for you, right? So. We do this in Nordea, and just basically very little about what my team is doing. I'm heading a container automation team that, was, uh, that I said before. We are running approximately 30,000 containers on our platform in multiple clusters. Um, out of those, 7,000 is in production. 
And our team, or my team, is basically doing not only container orchestration, but we also uh, manage and offer content monitoring, security, log aggregations, policies, compliance, and basically all of that. Um, and we do it in 10 people. And it's worked quite well. We try to have a quite resilient setup. Um, we have a couple of um, environment variables, or <laughs> environment variables, a couple of environments that we, that we use. We have a sandbox environment that is only for us testing, and then we have a couple of non-production environments that, you, that are used for the developers, and then we have a production environment where you can basically go and promote. And how do we keep all of these in check? Because it is sort of number of clusters, number of environments is growing, is that we actually use something called Customize. And Customize is not really a templating tool, it's a, it's a neat feature that is already built in into kubectl. Um, Customize basically allows you to inherit some definitions, and then you can override them as local changes. So what I have in mind is that, in our case, is that, um, and let's take one example of a monitoring stack that we have, because I mean, that is gonna be tightly related to the incident that we had before, is that we have some base, then we have some agents, some cluster definitions, basically random stuff. You have some components, and then we have overlays, and all of those overlays that you can see, it's a couple of our clusters. Um, for compliance reasons, some of the things that you see is basically obfuscated names, so they don't really make any meaning, but I mean, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about, right? So this is like a base structure for every component that we, that we have in our um, version control. And uh, we can simply tweak a little bit different clusters and make sure that then our GitOps operator that we use takes that from the Bitbucket or to takes it from a Git or GitHub or whatever else you use and syncs it continuously to your cluster. So that's the setup. Chapter two. Now the, the interesting part, the incident. One summer afternoon, me and my team, we are 10 people as I said, but we are distributed, so we actually have these virtual coffee meetings as opposed to people that work in the same room and they can actually go and talk to buy the coffee machine. So we have these virtual coffee machines where we, Interestingly enough, never drink coffee, but uh, we have chats and what's going, what not. And um, one day, basically, uh, we are talking and suddenly our phones started to buzzing. We got some emails, people started screaming and it's like, okay, what is going on? Something is happening. Obviously, sometimes or oftentimes something is happening, but this was happening at a scale. There was a couple of teams or multiple of teams reaching out at the same time, telling us that they have a problem. And it's like, okay, let's finish the coffees and we can attend to the, to the people at need. So basically what they reported is that there is no communication whatsoever happening from the applications. And this was production, approximately 150 nodes um, and nothing was working. A simple example of what you would do, you would expect that you do some curl to Google, well-known addresses, and basically just goes, cannot resolve host. Anyone guessing what happened? Sorry? Always the network? It's always DNS. Great idea. It was, in this case, it was DNS. We, we would hope to actually, <laughs> we, would, we would honestly hope to blame it on networks, but uh, in this case, it was actually, it was actually DNS. Um, and this was the problem. Um, we, looked, we looked into our cube system namespace, we checked the core DNS, and it actually looked something like that all of them crashing completely and basically being boom, killed out of memory. And I was like, okay, this is new. This never happened. This technically shouldn't happen. So it's like, we have a problem and now we need to fix it, right? So the hunt, who to pin it on? Um, <laughs> you know, normally when something happens with applications, they always come and say, oh, it's a platform problem. In this case it was, but I mean, generally it's not. <laughs> Um, so they always go, so, so, so from our perspective, it's always like we would hope to pin it on, on a project. So what do you do um, when you're hunting for something that happens? It's like, okay, these kind of things, they don't really happen without a cause. So we are looking for a change. And when you're looking for a change on a platform, you're usually looking at ideally some locks. In this case, we use Kubernetes audit, uh, Kubernetes audit locks. It is a great way of basically getting some information, what has happened, by whom, when, how, and whatnot. So if you're not using logs, I would definitely highly recommend. I'm not going too details into, into what Kubernetes logs are doing, uh, or at least audit logs, but this is a native function. If you're not listening or not collecting these, you definitely should because it can save you a lot of troubles, especially eventually blaming someone. 
um, just a very short um, logs or audit logs, they have policies. You, can, you have four different setups. You have none, you have metadata, you have requests and response requests. It's basically about how much data you're collecting. I think it was um, two, talks about, uh, two talks before we were talking about, or there was, there was a discussion about how much data you collect and how much you, how much you store. This is a great example of basically blowing up your log collector. So none is basically no data whatsoever, and that's fine, but you also never see anything. Metadata is at least sort of URLs and changes, and you see what components. With requests and re re responses, it actually can blow up because it might be a lot of lines of YAML file that is basically being um, filled in. So audit logs, let's go in. We have started hearing problems at around a certain point of time, but usually changes or sometimes they propagate for longer periods. So we have decided that we take a half an hour sort of period of the logs before and let's see what's wrong. And when that happens, you basically get hit by 58,000 log lines, um, which uh, no one sane would actually go and sort of read through all of them. So we need to apply a little bit of basic, basic filtering. So as you can see, sort of a pseudocode, you start with your audit logs, you're sourcing the cluster where the problem is happening, and uh, yeah, you, you get hit by the 58,000 logs number, and then, okay, we need to do something. So what do we do? Well, first of all, changes don't just happen out of thin air. Changes have to be either created, change can be also something deleted, or change can be something that is actually updated. So when we do additional filtering only on sort of verbs out of those logs, we actually were able to scale down the number of logs that we had, still more than 7,000, not humanly possible to go through all of them. Um, if you investigate a little bit um, in deep into what these logs actually contain, you can see that there is a lot of system logs that you have never heard of before and then you will never most likely need to worry about. So we actually decided to have a look into the Kubernetes resources that actually make sense because we're still hoping to pin it on an application. So you're looking into secrets, config maps, you know, deployments uh, uh, and whatnot. Luckily, we only had 10 logs left, which was okay. We can actually go through them. Looking into the 10 logs, we were actually able to see that it was only three namespaces that actually had some sort of a change within, within the half an hour, which sounded good. Obviously, this was still all guessing because it could happen even before and we would need to go into the, in, more into the past, but I mean, this is what happened. Um, what struck us most was that, okay, we have two application um, uh, namespaces. There was an alpha prot and a gamma prot, uh, but there was something that was called monitoring agents, and then we know that well, that is not something that our applications that are hosted on the platform that are using, that's actually something that my team is doing. So it's like, I must basically type into the team, hey guys, anyone did any changes? It's like, no. It's like, okay. So, so, so let's see what's going on. Um, the log actually looks a little bit like that. Um, eventually we thought that, you know, when you think about applications and something like a monitoring agent, monitoring agent is deployed on every single machine. So if something is causing a core DNS overload, it is most likely in bulk. It really was pretty much signs of distributed, you know, DDoS attack sort of from within. So we, we before we started to reaching out to the applications, I just say, hey, did you by any way sort of crash the cluster? It was like, okay, let's let's just double check those no sayers that if they really did change something. So you have a log, something like that. You see, you have a name monitoring agents. It's in that namespace. It's that resource. It's like, okay. Um, let's see, because we know that all of this is controlled through the GitOps, and thus some change must have happened in, in, in some Git, is that we have seen that there is a timestamp, and this is from our legal, I cannot really disclose anything about this, so you will see a lot of access, um, but it's not really very important. You basically know that there is a timestamp, and from a timestamp you actually go into the Git log, and you basically check that in this repository has any change happened. And indeed it did. There was a change that was pushed in production that no one said that did. I was like, excellent. Uh, one of those is actually a name. So, so you could actually go and I was like, are you really sure that you didn't push this? Because I mean, this one says that you did. Uh, and we have actually found that what it was. It was a single line in our sort of agent um, configuration. Um, very quickly, what happened? You have cluster of 150, 150 servers. You have 150 agents monitoring that are basically monitoring your stuff on every, every single machine. When we did that without actually further reading through documentation or actually really understanding what we do is that every single agent started monitoring and scraping and everything, the whole platform. 
So not only looking at its own sort of stuff, but it was basically 155 sort of squared everything what was happening on the whole platform. Coordinates crashed. They couldn't really cope with that load. Um, so honestly, it literally took us five minutes to get it out and recover platform to the, to the previous state. And uh, this is both testimony on how, when you sort of a little bit mismanage use of GitOps, can actually lead that, well, you'll have, you will have some problem, and I will also get into like, what was the problem. But at the same time, you can actually, when you know that what, what was the change, you can actually revert it, and you can get into a normal state quite quick. Obviously, this was still a guess. I mean, it was, it was one of the best guesses, but it, it could have been that we changed this and nothing would have happened, and then we, we would need to continue the investigation, right? So, at this moment, this concludes the hunt. Now we can go into the actual investigation. So, what exactly had happened? Why did this happen? Um, it was honestly a series of unfortunate events. Very, very sad. I actually, I literally blame it on summer. In Denmark, we are not used to a nice summers. Uh, people expect rain, and when it's sunny, everyone's sort of like drugged. You know, you, you get a lot of that D vitamin, and I mean, it's, it's just nonsense. So, so first of all, what happened uh, is that, well, the change was actually tested. So, I mean, we have lower environments where we test these changes. The problem was that the change actually propagated with the scale. So when you test something on a, on, a, on a sandbox environment, which has 10 nodes and no workloads, of course, if you sort of blow up the monitoring, I mean, it doesn't blow up on anything, so, so there is nothing. So the lower environments were a little bit too slow for us to actually notice. And we only blew up, and this is a secret at the moment, we only blew up a production and pre-production at the same time. No one at that point for us investigating was talking about the pre-production because of course when production is burning, no one really cares about some, something that is basically happening in a lower environment. So the production config was actually bundled with a pre-production change. So indeed when we asked within the team that, hey guys, did you actually change something in production? The answer was no, because the guy who was doing this thought that he's only changing pre-production environment. And fair enough, we should have double checked, or we should have something in, in place, but I mean, we'll get into it. So this was basically a bundled change in across environments, which it's not really a good thing. Um, then, of course, when we do changes, we have approvers, I mean, four eyes principle, and I will get back to it. People sometimes tend to approve things that they don't fully understand. Anyone guilty of that practice? Anyone ever sort of approved? Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> <clears throat> so this happens fairly often. And I mean, yes, it's annoying because somebody's sitting, on a, somebody's sitting on a change and you're trying to basically, hey guys, I mean, I'm pushing to this. Can somebody approve? And then you start pinging, pinging the whole team. Then you start pinging the people. Eventually somebody's going to press it because literally it was just one line. I mean, like, what could have, what could have gone wrong, right? <laughs> uh, well, this could have gone wrong. Um, and then the last one was, and this is a little bit more on a, on a personal thing or personal note, is that our colleague was working on the wrong assumption. And I, and I will get into why. The wrong assumption, part of it was that he was merging both pre-production and production um, at the same time. And he actually did it knowingly. So he knew what he was doing. He just didn't think that the production is going to be merged at the time. And why did he assume that? Well, because our GitHub tool actually has a time synchronization windows. So we had it configured that we don't make any changes during the business time, or which is usually um, between eight and five um, Central European time. So even though he was pushing this on a nice afternoon, a couple of hours before business closes, he thought that a change would never actually land on production because the synchronization window for, for production is actually the next morning. Well, what he didn't know was that the synchronization window was disabled two days ago. So, um, Another obviously very good reason why somebody was trying to push something during the day and not, not in the morning, right? So he was working with the, with the wrong assumptions about synchronization and nothing really for him to blame. It's just something that me and my team, we need to work on, right? So series of unfortunate events. And out of these, we basically develop a couple of learnings that I'm basically just trying to promote here as uh, they are fairly interesting and important, especially if you would want to go down this road. So, when we go into testing, 
I would very much strongly encourage you to use different environments. Um, Kind of depends, of course, how big your platform is. If you have five customers, you maybe need one non-production, one production environment. If you have 50, you maybe need two and something for yourself. We actually have hundreds, or we have actually more than 500 different teams that are integrating with our non-production platforms, and we have more than 100 of them in a production. So it is a fairly big scale within a banking sector, which also has regulated on different scales. So there are some compliance reasons why we have multiple uh, testing environments, but this is a really good thing to sort of make sure that you catch your changes before, right? Um, one change per environment. Even though that you know that you have different sort of catching mechanisms, so you have synchronization windows, you have four app principles, but you should always sort of think of the worst. Like, if that doesn't work, and if the person approving is blind, and if a computer doesn't know what's going on, then by basically you should, you should really still make the effort, and I know that as developers we are, or DevOps engineers, and I know that I shouldn't call it that self, but I mean basically people that work with these things. Um, we are lazy, but we shouldn't be as lazy as making basically separate change for separate environments. That way you can very nicely sort of catch off what is going on. Um, Forest principle, and this is, I would say, I mean, this is very basic. I mean, you, you all started laughing when I started talking about people basically, you know, blindly approving and all of that. Um, uh, but it's not only about sort of watching over someone else, someone's shoulder. So I, at least I wouldn't see it like that. So obviously you sometimes want someone to double check your work, especially if you're working on a change that, ha that you have been working on for weeks and weeks and weeks or whatever, days and days and days or hours and hours and hours. And you can actually see it imprinted on your, on your eyes. So you, you can't see a problem even though it's there. So you need a fresh set of eyes to actually someone look over it, potentially question, and then eventually realize that, well, what you have done maybe doesn't make too much of a sense. On the other hand, um, especially for you guys who are, let's say, more junior or you have junior people in your teams, you can actually use this as a learning experience. We have talked, previous talk was about the culture of collaborating that is difficult. And it's not only between the teams, but sometimes you also have it in, inside a team. Every individual is busy. We are all busy. So, of course, when someone comes and asks me, hey, can you help me? It's like, yes, I can, but I have to push this into production. So give me like three hours or 10 days and then I'll get back to you. Um, that sometimes happens. Using four eyes principle, you can actually, as a senior person, make a change and give it to the junior guy. It's like, okay, you looked into this and you will not approve before you understand what's going on. And then you can go and ask me questions because then those people can actually challenge you. And as they challenge you, you can practice, well, first of all, you can practice how you explain stuff, but then also secondly, you can, you can practice or sort of really understand if you know what you're changing. So I wouldn't, especially at this point, I mean, it seems simple, but I wouldn't see it as simple. I, I would very much encourage you to basically use it as a learning opportunity. You can then write less documentation and you can do more merge requests and actually educate your teammates on this. Number four, when making a larger changes, and let me, this is maybe a little bit specific, but when making larger changes, or we, if you are in a business that is quite sensitive on outages in production, I would highly recommend to use synchronization windows. Again, it's another safety net that you have for yourself. Even if you push something during the day or during the evening, but you know it's gonna be synced in the morning, and then you can go and check it. It's very predictable also for your customers to get basic verification done, so you can tell them like, hey, this change is going to happen at six in the morning, because we have enabled it. What is a benefit for us as engineers, developers, operations, and managers, you don't have to wake up at six in the morning, because this is gonna happen automatically. So you can basically just wake up at mayhem 7.30 and um, see what's going on. Um, Again, it's opinionated, uh, maybe not completely necessary, but I just wanted to point it out that it makes sense at some point to actually have this. Um, maybe one thing that is sort of important to mention, watch for the time zones. I mean, in Denmark is not, usually not a problem, but I mean, we are operating in, also in Finland, which is already plus one. Sometimes you have colleagues in England, which is minus one. The problems with synchronization and time zones can also make it a little bit more rough. And then number five, and I didn't talk about this before. Um, I think I touched upon it a little bit at the beginning, but that is that when you're making changes, especially when you're using some sort of a templating language or templating framework, um, be very, very curious 
or very um, cautious about what is happening. I showed you that before, what we have changed was basically just one line in the Git, and then there was like one line in the Git was a one line in Kubernetes. But in reality, and this is something that we kind of realized during the, when we brainstormed, like how should we actually handle these kind of things afterwards, is that this would be a really good thing to, to create. So we actually created a small, what we call a, a, a GitOps spot, and I will get into it very quickly. So just an example. Imagine that you have your customization file, which basically just says that these are, these are the changes that I want to do, and I want to add one row. So in Git, this is actually what you're gonna see, that this is the change that somebody is approving. What in reality is happening is that you're adding this resource onto the cluster. And this is just a single example. Those of you who potentially use, let's say, Helm for packaging your applications, and you do version control change from one to another, it would be one line. You just change 124 to 125. This file would have thousands of lines, especially if you deal with CRDs and whatnot. So be aware of the changes that what you are actually merging, like what is the actual difference on the, on the platform from what is the actual difference on your Git or version control. So we have something that we call a GitOps. I should now say when I send this slide, I only afterwards noticed that I made a little mistake. Um, so um, the, what a GitOps bot does is that when we create a merge request, the GitOps bot basically listens to the merge request, takes it, and then does a checkout on a master, and it doesn't do a checkout on another master, but it actually does a checkout on the feature branch. Yes, this is a clear copy-paste error. Um, so it basically does a checkout on the master branch, sorry, master branch, feature branch. It does a customized build on both, so we actually see that expanded changes happening. We do the diff on those, so we can see actually a full difference of what is actually gonna be applied, and we attach it as a, as a comment on the merge request. And this basically happens seamlessly. It's really not that complicated. And uh, it actually saves a little bit of time, especially when doing sort of like these Git changes. Because as I said before, in reality, in version control, you're looking at this, where you should be actually looking at this, right? Um, so this is like a homey developed thing. Any student can basically do this on a laptop, on a, on a knee sort of in three hours. Not that difficult. Yeah. So, to summarize, um, use audit logs. They are your friend, especially when something actually, something bad happens. Um, when you use audit logs to discover something, then you, of course, you should also test for environments to verify that your changes actually propagate nicely from place to place. When making a Git change, you always, yeah, target only one environment. That way you minimize, minimize the blast radius and you don't have to be in that weird sort of there is nothing worse than going into an incident review with top management and you basically go and say like, yeah, so we did something that we shouldn't have done. And we know that we did that and we thought that we would get away with it, but now it blew up into a production incident and now we are sorry. <laughs> um, good, uh, use a good, uh, good use of the four eyes principle. Um, use it for educating others, explaining. Don't use it as that sort of mandatory or somebody needs to click this button and I'm so tired of it because I wanted to have this, um, have this done basically three hours ago. Utilize, configure, um, oh yeah, utilize and configure predictable time windows. This is with asterisk, you don't have to, but I mean, it, it is a good practice going forward. And when templating, the simple git diff might not really be enough. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We there still we have. have four minutes. There is something in front, there is something back. Which one first? first. So this <laughs> one first. Okay, we do this one and the next one. Yeah. Thank you. It was funny because I faced the exact same issue in production with God DNS. Basically, we created a DDoS attack with, mm. on it. I think it's what happened with the service degree from primitives. So basically my question is, right now your example was a scale factor issue basically. Mm -hmm. Even if you are trying to replicate that in a testing environment, you do different diff everything with Argo CD or else. Yes. Technically, 
your pre-production, your staging, your development cluster will not face the exam set amount of traffic or request um, that you, you can have in your production. And for example, we brought several times the Kubernetes API with too much requests from Argo CD. And because we had much, much more applications and much more deployments mm -hmm. than we could, may have on, on our laptops or in pre-productions, yep. how you can solve that issue of the, that scale factor issue, how you can anticipate that, especially when even with a feature like the, the service discovery in Prometheus, you have the description in the documentation, but except if you dig into the code, you don't know exactly what the Prometheus will do to mm. for the discovery. So we will not be really able to know before it will try with uh, broadcasting to detect the services or else. Yeah. Um, well, in our case, when we actually blew up production, we actually also blew up reproduction, as I said, because it was a change that went both into pre-production and production. Our pre-production checked that. I mean, we blew up reproduction as well. Um, in, a, in a grand scheme of things, I don't think you would be able to anticipate that. Of course, some monitoring of core DNS would be in place, and, and we had that, but also we have a lot of users, and they start to complain very quickly when applications stop, to use, stop working. Um, how to prevent it? Um, I don't think there is, a, there is a good way of actually preventing it. I think one thing is that you can actually revert out of this bad situation and maybe try to do better testing, you know, just to see that how does some metrics actually move, even if you do that. So, so of course, we could have seen that in a, in a low environments that the usage of the core DNS grew, but it just didn't go through the roof. And maybe that should have fl flagged it a little bit for us that, okay, even though we have grown the, in, in sandbox environment, the utilization of core DNS was by 20% higher. And we know that we don't really use that environment that much. So, I mean, if we do this in production, it will probably just go through the roof. Um, the same as preventive actions, I think it's also important to be able to basically recover quite quickly. So, of course, when you get eventually some scaling issues, well, you can also cut the cluster in half and basically try to do some load balancing across. I don't think there is an, any sort of smart answer that anyone figured this out. So, I mean, eventually you will grow out of proportions, you will realize it, you will slice the service, you go down, and then again, sort of abstractions on top of the abstractions. Okay, we have one last question, and it's going to be hopefully a fast one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so, so uh, when you do this syncs, uh, GitHub syncs, you always sync with the uh, uh, head of master, essentially, of, 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 of your Git repository. Yep. Um, one of the strengths of Git is that you have all the old versions in there as well. Yes. And it's super, super stressful to, to, to try to debug and mitigate, and mitigate out an incident as it is happening. Do you ever, um, do you ever sync with a Git ref that's a day old, for example, to go back to a good state and then deploy and, and, and then mitigate and investigate in, uh, in, in, in the safety of your uh, office, or is that not possible in this setup? Do, do you mean like trying to take this, like what we, what we destroyed and apply it on a different, like safe environment and try to see what's going on, or just simply... Um, so, so you reverted the specific diff that was failing, but you could, yeah. could, could you just have, have reverted basically a full days of... of yeah, yeah, of course, we could, we could have, we were, yeah. Like, I mean, um, in reality, this is all about that we had a version, um, we had a commit that worked before, right? And I mean, we don't also do these updates very often. Yeah. So, so since we don't do like hundreds of every day or week, we can actually, we could safely just basically go one back. Mm -hmm. For us, it would it actually solve the problem, but of course, if if it wouldn't save the problem, we would need to go more into into some some um, additional discoveries. Yeah. But I think it's also a little bit trusting into the system that you know that you have the latest Git that actually ha have you, you had your platform in a stable state, mm -hmm. and that is where you can always basically return, right? And then that's sort of the premise that we work with, unless we sort of break it, and then I will be here with a different talk. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.